As I think some of you will know, as part of the educational program, we have a, uh, a series of awards every year, uh, and one of those awards is the postdoctoral award. And every year we get an extraordinary number of really great applicants uh, for that award. But last year, as I think Karun will uh, agree with me, was an unprecedented year, possibly partly due to COVID. We got a huge number of applications, and the quality of them was so high that we actually made an exceptional decision to offer smaller bursaries to the short, some of the shortlistees. But of that very large number of brilliant candidates, the strong is sitting a few seats down from me, Parasa Mostajit, um, whose work uh, impressed us so enormously. So I'm really happy uh, to have Parasa, who is the Jeffrey Rubinoff postdoctoral awardee this year with us. Uh, Parissa was, a, was an undergraduate at the University of Cambridge. She did not one master's, but two master's, one at King's College London, the other one at the University of Chicago. She then completed her PhD at the University of Chicago a couple of years ago, I think it was, and now she's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Chicago. Parissa focuses on, I think, a subject that would have thrilled Jeffrey Rubinoff, and I'm sure had he been alive, he would have cornered you in Seabreeze and wanted to talk about your work at great length, because she focuses on the kinds of knowledge that are produced by science and art and the differences between those two things. And she spent a lot of time arguing that science it isn't the only source of knowledge uh, about the world. And uh, today, she is going to talk about the relationship between art and social and racial justice in 20th century America, and asking, in some ways, how art can be used to attain justice in the face of crisis. So please, let's welcome Parissa Mostajir. generous and flattering uh, introduction. Thanks so much. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just so nice to come to a community like this and, and talk to people who have so many different ways of intersecting with um, the beauty of art and the justice, I guess, of art too. Um, okay. So uh, when I heard of the theme for this year of art and crisis, art in times of crisis, I decided that I wanted to take this as an opportunity to present on a topic that's actually very new to me. Um, but first of all, it's a gap that is not random, certainly not politically random, um, and so I really wanted to fill it. It's something that I take very seriously. I, I, uh, it's, it's not a coincidence that um, although I'm a pragmatist philosopher focusing on the early 20th century and debates about science and art, that the two individuals I'm talking about today uh, who fit that description exactly um, are not very well known to me, and it's not a coincidence, I think, that they're both African-American, right? Uh, a lot of the people that I deal with are white men, so um, I wanted to fill that gap. And also, it just felt very relevant, right? They talk about art and crisis. Um, being two African-Americans um, in the Harlem Renaissance uh, in you know, the 1920s and the, the years before, um, crisis was just part of their lives. It was part of, you know, the reality of being black in America. And arguably, I think it's, I mean, it still is. So, um, so today I'm going to be talking about the philosophical debates around art and politics that were taking place among African American um, intellectuals, particularly two, um, during the Harlem Renaissance. So specifically, I've become very interested in uh, the debate between W.E.B. Du Bois and Alan Locke on art and propaganda, maybe art as propaganda. Um, uh, and the disagreement between these two figures has traditionally been understood as a clash between the view that African-American art should be used as an instrument of political change and the purest view that African-American artistic expression should be pursued purely for the sake of aesthetic qualities, intrinsic aesthetic artistic value. Um, or what might be called art for art's sake, um, 
This is sort of how, how it's often framed. So in this talk, I'm going to provide some reasons for thinking, actually, that this isn't a wholly accurate or helpful way of viewing the disagreement between them. And um, I'll very briefly uh, offer some alternative ways of framing this disagreement that might allow a more um, nuanced uh, and generous understanding of the complexity of their ideas. Um, OK. So. OK, perfect, OK. So I'll first introduce the, the Harlem Renaissance briefly. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Then I'll outline the debate between Alan Locke and W.E.B. Du Bois as traditionally understood, that is the clash uh, between viewing art as political propaganda, properly speaking, um, uh, as opposed to you know, art practiced for art's sake. Um, and then I'll go on to uh, indicate some reasons why this actually might not be a very accurate or helpful way of understanding the disagreement, and then maybe if I have time, um, I'll briefly provide three other possible ways of classifying the disagreement between them. So uh, many of you may be familiar with the, the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and 1930s. So this began in Harlem, of course, in New York City, but it began shortly after the start of the Great Migration which was um, a mass migration of formerly enslaved, I mean, 50 years prior, the Emancipation Proclamation happened, and um, of African Americans from southern states to northern cities like Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. Um, so African Americans at that time were fleeing violence and oppression and uh, just a general lack of opportunities in southern states including um, restrictions on voting rights, lack of access to resources, educational resources, job opportunities, um, civic resources. They were fleeing poor living conditions, um, as well as um, the all too frequent, very ugly reality of uh, racial violence like lynching and uh, race riots, um, including insurrections, right? There were actually you know, white mob insurrections uh, that ousted democratically elected African-American um, people who held office, right, in, in certain southern cities. Um, so it was, it was a crisis, right? uh, uh, without a doubt. Um, so when, um, gosh, I mean, I think we're talking about millions over the course, I, I should have written down this number, but millions over the course of a few decades. When these, you know, uh, millions of African-Americans arrived in northern cities, they tended to live in segregated areas um, and this is what happened in Harlem in New York City. So large numbers of mostly working class African Americans from the South uh, migrated to Harlem in New York City seeking work opportunities and safety. Um, but we also see more affluent and highly educated African Americans arriving there too. Um, so this included upper class uh, African Americans who had the financial means to support and nurture an artistic and literary culture. And so um, in the midst of uh, the 1920s, right, amidst this, this bustling combination of people from different places, different talents, different means, we see the peak of what's now called the Harlem Renaissance, right, a vibrant African-American melting pot, which poured out cultural, artistic, and literary and scholarly uh, works, and really captured the attention of mainstream, um, you know, white-dominated societies across the United States and, and Europe, too. So we start to see um, literary and political magazines springing up in New York City, devoted to African-American social and cultural affairs. These were circulated widely among communities in Harlem and, and other African-American urban neighborhoods. Um, these included the Crisis, um, Opportunity, and Messenger magazines. Um, we also have poets, novelists, and playwrights, such as Zora Neale Hurston, um, particularly famous one, um, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, James Weldon Johnson, County Cullen, uh, Jesse Fawcett, um, and others. And then we have musicians, like, uh, you know, I mean, jazz, music, jazz musicians um, like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Bessie Smith. And although lesser known than their literary counterparts, certainly in the literature, people mostly focus on the literary culture, and I know that's going to disappoint some of you here, but um, uh, Harlem also attracted visual artists, right, like um, the painter Aaron Douglas and um, photographer James Van Der Zee. 
So um, they, were, they were there, right? <laughs> they were there. Not exactly front and center in the, in the analysis, but, but they were there. So, um, uh, right, okay, and of course then amidst all of this creativity, um, public figures, intellectuals, public philosophers, began discussing the relevance of this growing artistic and literary culture for the ongoing broader struggle for equal rights for black people in the United States. Um, and two major figures were involved. I mean, they were at the forefront of this discussion, right? They, they became sort of iconic figures. Uh, one was W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, who many of you will be familiar with. He was, um, he actually sort of started out as a, a world famous sociologist, um, but also an activist who by the 1920s had actually given up his position at Atlanta University as a sociologist. And he'd um, moved to New York City to take up the, um, the editorship of The Crisis, which is arguably the most influential um, African-American literary magazine at the time. And maybe since, I think it went on for quite a few decades. I don't know, I just, I cut off my awareness when it gets to a certain point in the 20th century. I'm like, nope, I just look backwards, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> um, it's a little unhelpful actually, but. Uh, um, and then another figure is Alan Locke. Um, he was a former professor of English literature and philosophy at Howard University. That's a historically black, uh, university in, um, uh, strangely conservative, but actually historically black uh, university in uh, the United States. Um, and his 1925 anthology um, of African-American literature and illustrations, uh, which is called The New Negro, um, uh, containing poetry, fiction, uh, history, scholarship, uh, criticism, uh, political and cultural commentary, and also illustrations, um, that established Locke as a well-known and respected figure among African-American cultural and literary uh, communities. Um, so, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this. So um, obviously the term Negro is like a very inappropriate and offensive term. <laughs> I do not use that in my language, but when I'm directly quoting, um, I uh, hope you'll permit me um, to use this now very outdated term, um, just, just during direct quotations. Um, okay, so, uh, just to sort of look at this debate on the face of it. So in December 1925, at the peak of the Harlem Renaissance, Alan Locke published this anthology, The New Negro. And this sparked a famous and very public clash of opinion between him and Du Bois on the connection between the artistic culture developing in Harlem and the long-standing uh, pursuit of racial justice for African Americans. So um, in The New Negro, Locke complained that there had been a hampering habit of setting artistic values with primary regard for moral effect, right? Um, so this kind of propagandistic approach. Uh, and he, he urged artists to instead seek and find art's intrinsic values and satisfactions, right? Aesthetic values, right? There's, there's an aesthetic, an importance to aesthetic values there. Um, now, the month after... <laughs> Uh, this was published in January of 1926. Du Bois wrote a review, not entirely positive review, although it was, it was largely positive, but he said he had certain things to say about this, uh, this anthology. So he said, um, Mr. Locke has newly been seized with the idea that beauty rather than propaganda should be the object of Negro literature and art. Um, it is a grave question if ever in this world, in any Renaissance, there can be a search for disembodied beauty which is not really a passionate effort to do something tangible. Um, tangibility there, I think, is, is quite important. Um, and he says, if Mr. Locke's thesis is insisted on too much, it's going to turn the Negro Renaissance into decadence. Um, so, the debate did not end there, you know. Uh, so in his, uh, in his address to the annual meeting of the NAACP, um, which is a famous essay entitled Criteria of Negro Art, it was later published in the crisis uh, in October 1926, Du Bois continued to insist, oh wait, no, where is that? Ah, there it is, okay, sorry. He continued to insist um, that all art is propaganda and ever must be despite the wailing of the purists. And I think that the purists there is, uh, is just a way of referring to, to Alan Locke probably. Um, at least that's certainly how historians of this period sort of seem to interpret it. So um, uh, even into 1928 actually, so like two, maybe even th almost three years later, Locke was publishing articles like this one from the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, which said that 
this is, gets a little personal. So the work of Du Bois and other writers are all essentially in the category of problem literature and gain half or more of their value as social documents. But the work of the younger generation, right, he, was, he was very um, affirming of a younger generation of poets um, and writers, stands artistically self-sufficient and innerly controlled. Right? They're focusing on the aesthetic quality. They're focusing on like, developing a genuinely aesthetic culture. Um, du Bois, I mean, this is just problem literature. right? It just, it's, its value is moral and political value. There's no aesthetic value there. right? Um, so, uh, so in fact, um, Alan Locke then actually in 1928 was a, a, a major player in the establishment of a rival magazine to the crisis um, called Harlem. Uh, that, that was established in November 1928. Didn't last past its first issue, which I don't know what that really says about the debate there and who won. But, um, but in the introductory essay, anyway, Locke stated the reasons for setting up this rival position, this rival publication, sorry, as follows. He says, the three journals, um, in which, of course, he includes the crisis, which have been vehicles of most of our artistic expressions have been the avowed organs of social movements and organized social programs. All our purely artistic publications have been sporadic. There is all the greater need, then, for a sustained vehicle of free and purely artistic expression. And it's in this essay that he, um, he famously claims that artists should choose art and put aside propaganda. Okay, so now at first glance, it really seems like, um, this is, sorry, this is Alan Locke on the left and Du Bois on the right. Um, these are some illustrations actually out of the anthology, The New Negro, made by um, Winold Rice um, that were themselves a source of contention, which is, which is interesting. Um, he's, Winold Rice is, was white. Um, I think that was, that was part of the issue. But so at first glance, it looks like these two individuals had a very familiar disagreement on a very well-known theme, right, which Du Bois refers to as a controversy as old as the world. This could be summarized as the question, should we create art for art's sake, um, or should we create politically and socially instrumental art, or propaganda, right? And on the face of it, we have Du Bois, the propagandist, stating that all art is propaganda, um, it ought to be... It, oriented towards extrinsic, tangible effects on the world, and specifically, it should contribute to the political goal of racial justice. And on the other hand, there's Locke, the purist, saying that artists must choose art, put aside propaganda, and that the tendency to produce art uh, with a specific extrinsic moral effects in mind uh, stifles the development of um, aesthetic and artistic quality, right? So this is how the debate has really been understood. So Leonard Harris, sorry for the long, the long quotations. I'm a very exegetical, you know, historian of philosophy. So this is sadly this is the world I dwell in. Um, but uh, but you know, Leonard Han Harris uh, characterizes it as follows: When Du Bois rejects the idea of art for art's sake, he's clearly defending the position that artworks that fail to perform a propaganda role aren't worth a thimble. Um, because they fail to promote a meta narrative according to which blacks should fight against injustices. Uh, skipping ahead a little bit, Locke, in disagreement with Du Bois, believes that artists should be free to conceive of the world in unique ways, even if they're not instrumental for the purpose of creating appropriate motivations for racial uplift. Right? Um, similarly, um, Paul Taylor has written on this. He's characterized it as um, uh, revolving around the question, should ethical concerns shape our approach to the practice of cultural expression? He says, for some, the commitment to civil rights by copyright, that's, that was what this sort of propagandist approach was called. For, for some, the commitment to civil rights by copyright meant that artists, sorry, art should answer to the demands of politics. In practice, this meant that the content of art was subject to political criticism. Black artists were to present black folks in the best light for the sake of hastening the racial rapprochement reproachment <laughs> that expressive culture supposedly made possible. And they were to refrain from exploring the seedier aspects of black life, the reality of black crime, poverty, and immorality notwithstanding. For others, the political triumph of black art would come only after black artists were granted the same freedom that other artists enjoyed, the freedom to answer the muse. Oh, I haven't got this on. Yeah, no, I do, I do, sorry. To answer the muse without regard for the political ramifications of the work. Um, so Robert Gooding Williams also characterizes this, this as propagandism versus purism. So there are solid reasons for understanding the debate this way, and I think we've seen a few of them 
in you know, Locke's and uh, Du Bois's own statements. Um, I don't want to characterize this work, this framework as entirely misleading, right? But as I dug deeper into this debate, I noticed that the disagreement uh, between these two figures is actually not so clearly definable in this way. There's actually a, a lot more sort of complexity. And um, in the rest of this talk, I'll try to explain why propaganda versus purism or propagandism versus purism isn't actually um, super helpful. And then I'll briefly offer some alternative ways of framing the disagreements, which I think do better justice to the complexity of their views. So, um, uh, so on the one hand, right, why is this actually, uh, from, from the point of view of you know, Locke's, uh, Locke and Du Bois' uh, debate, like this, is, this is actually, it's, it's not such an unreasonable way of framing this. So Du Bois um, does say that the value of art made by um, black artists does seem to clearly lie in its functional efficacy, right? The something tangible that it produces in the world. Um, beauty or aesthetic value is properly connected with broader social effects, right? Um, and more specifically, those broader social effects are political effects, right? So in order for an art, uh, an artwork to be truly beautiful, it has to also move us in the direction of justice, right? And political justice. But here's the weird thing. So um, Du Bois's insistence that art must have tangible effects and political effects um, was actually explicitly shared by Ellen Locke. So I was just, this is just so bizarre. So, in, so among African-American public intellectuals at that time, to claim that art had no role to play in the, uh, in the movement towards racial justice was actually highly unusual. It was pretty obvious to everyone that it had something to do with it, right? That it was actually a really important part of this project. So, and Alan, Alan Locke is, is no exception here. So, um, yeah. Oh, there's the cover for the new Negro. I think that's the original cover, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I was trying to look around for it. Um, so, uh, right, so in, in Locke's work, we can actually see a complex view of the power and purposes of art, which are certainly not, I wouldn't call it sort of a naive form of purism. So he actually focuses on, on art's ability to generate new forms of subjectivity. So for an individual and for a community, right, forms of, uh, of new black subjectivity, as well as a number of tangible and political effects, right. So in terms of individual subject formation, Locke believed that it was the duty of black artists to develop a sense of African-American identity which was free from the frameworks, the pre-existing and still very strong frameworks of white supremacy. Um, so in The New Negro, Locke says that African-Americans feel, quote, the necessity for fuller, truer self-expression, right? This was, I mean, this was a time, you have to remember when there was, it wasn't just that people didn't want to give African-Americans jobs or, you know, let them use public resources. There were theories about what African-Americans were capable of, right? Um, were they actually, you know, as advanced as uh, European, people with European heritage, right? Um, and it was something that was actually being debated, right? It was being debated in anthropology, it was being debated in, in sociology. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, for Locke, um, art is gonna help African-American individuals break out of this idea of themselves, right? This, I this idea of themselves as um, these sort of intrinsically racially inferior beings. Um, so by developing new forms of self-conception and subjectivity, African-Americans can actually experience a form of spiritual emancipation through art, right? That was the idea here. Um, a true and more dignified sense of self. And it was artists, right, who were going to lead the way in this regard. So he says, um, you're loving me for these quotes, right? So he says, uh, the sense of inferiority must be innerly compensated. self Con, sorry, self-conviction must supplant self-justification. And in the dignity of this attitude, a convinced minority must confront a white condescending majority. Art cannot completely accomplish this, but I believe it can lead the way. So the young black artist, right, and appreciators of art too, would the, you know, thereby achieve an inner mastery of mood and spirit, right? This was, uh, they would become sort of self-defining people who could break out of the, 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 the uh, really oppressive sense of inferiority that they were carrying around with them. 
So this task of developing new forms of subjectivity wasn't just an individual one, but it was also a communal one, right? So the poet, artist, and musician were concentrating, this is a quotation again, um, concentrating the racial side of their experience and heightening their race consciousness intentionally, right? So um, not, not trying to sort of escape the idea of themselves as black, right? The assimilationist project wasn't something they were trying to do. They were actually trying to cultivate a sense of being a, a people through developing an African-American aesthetic, right? Um, so uh, in aesthetically reforming what it meant to be a black subject, black artists were also making a race out of the disunited you know, elements. So um, let's see, where are we? Right here. So, so whereas African-Americans had previously been united through a common condition rather than a common consciousness, right? A, a sort of problem in common rather than a life in common, right? Um, we, we're all sort of African-Americans, like we understand that we are oppressed, we have the similar kinds of experiences of the world that are based in oppression and what we can't do, what we're considered incapable of doing, like a problem in common, right? In Harlem, Negro life is seizing upon its first chances for group expression and self-determination, right? So we actually go from being um, a uh, problem in common to having a common consciousness, right? A sense of belonging with each other, right? We are black. We belong to um, a kind of a kind of um, a thesis of blackness, right? Uh, this this is quite controversial. You know, some people were like, we should assimilate, but that wasn't uh, that wasn't Locke's approach. Um, so this artistic renaissance constituted a significant and satisfying new phase of group development, and uh, what Locke actually calls a spiritual coming of age. Um, so those are some of the, the tangible effects, because I really think that is tangible, right? Like uh, coming, I mean, it's, it's sort of conceptual, but it's also tangible. You sort of come to belong together. You come to reassess and reevaluate yourself, right? These are some of the tangible effects that Locke theorized would emerge from the Harlem Renaissance. But he also specifically thought that the spiritual awakening, um, this sort of rising to consciousness of a, a new black subjectivity, was actually also an essential step in a political project, right? So it was, it was explicitly political. African Americans up to the 1920s had severe obstructions in their path, right, in, in terms of their participation in American political life, in, in the American democratic project. Um, and I mentioned some of these, uh, the, these before, but so for Locke, the formation of racial community identity via the aesthetic generation of a new and self-determined black subjectivity, right? This was gonna strengthen the position of African Americans on the American political and cultural stage, right? And enhance their political agency in the United States. So in the New Negro, let's see, there it is. Locke said, the racialism of the Negro, the self-racialism of the Negro, because that they were self-determining, right? is only a constructive effort to build the obstructions, right, the oppressive uh, conditions in the stream of his progress into an efficient dam of social energy and power, right? Um, so democracy itself is obstructed and stagnated to the extent that any of its channels are closed, which they were to black people, um, uh, et cetera. So the choice is between American institutions frustrated on the one hand, through racism, right? We, we're not white. They're not going to let us in, right? We can't participate as, you know, embarrassed white people, like, trying to blend in, right? Um, so, so the choice is between uh, American institutions frustrated on the one hand, or, alternatively, the path that he was suggesting, American ideals progressively fulfilled and realized on the other through self-racialization. We become a community of African Americans proudly, self-determinedly, right? And it will be beautiful and people will like it, right? And then we can start to participate as equals in American society. Super uh, controversial, right? I'm not suggesting that this is like something that black people should try to do today. I don't know, you know, that's not for me to say, but historically, I think this is such an interesting um, idea. So um, where am I now? Ah, oh yeah, sorry, that's a different, that's a different thing. Okay, so, so, um, um, right, so in other words, African Americans had no 
choice, right? But to self-racialize, to co-opt, reclaim, transform their racial identity. Um, integration wasn't an available strategy and, and their racial identity was the only real promising channel for taking a place in a, uh, an American democratic uh, society. So um, much like Du Bois, Locke also hoped that this new aesthetic culture would lead to a revaluation of African Americans in the eyes of white society. So he says, um, the, the special cultural recognition they win should in turn prove the key to that revaluation of the Negro, which must precede or accompany any considerable further betterment of race relationships. Um, so uh, for Locke, the political project and the Harlem Renaissance, the cultural project, they were mutually embedded. Um, and in 1928, he was very clear. He says, our espousal of art thus becomes no mere idle acceptance of art for art's sake or cultivation of the last decadences of the over-civilized. Right? Um, so then just sort of from the, from the other side, right, Locke's critique of Du Bois also doesn't really fit, right, which is, which is also kind of weird. So, um, so let's take a look at, at the critiques that, uh, that Locke made of Du Bois. So first of all, Locke's rejection of propagandism, right, his rejection of Du Bois's position came mainly in the form of frustrations with um, African-American reformers who insisted on very specific, respectable presentations of African-Americans, right? Um, so this meant an insistence on literary portrayals of the less, um, well, black characters that were, that possessed moral virtue, right? They were living very middle-class lives, professional lives. Um, and really, they, they sort of objected to more complex portrayals of the less pleasant elements of African-American reality, right? Um, and this contingent of, of individuals also objected to the representation of black folk culture in art, preferring an emphasis on more highbrow or you know, classical styles. Um, so Locke argues that these critics, and, and this, so this is an, an interesting thing that he says. So he says, um, these critics forget how protectively closed the upper levels of Negro society have been and how stiffly posed they still are before the sociologist camera. Now remember that Du Bois himself is a sociologist, right? So when he says being they're stiffly posed before the sociologist camera, he he's he's alluding to Du Bois and and the community that sort of gathered around him. So, um, oh there they are. Sorry, so there it is. So Locke complained that this stiff posing had a number of negative effects, right? So from the aesthetic point of view, as we've seen, he argued that um, that propagandists allowed. Um, these kind of moral and political motives to choke their sense of artistry. Um, and Locke also criticized propagandist art for allowing the white other to be the judge of the value of black art. And in doing so, allowing itself to be trapped by existing conceptual frameworks, right? So um, he says, by responding explicitly to stereotypes and assumptions about black people, propaganda lives under the shadow of a dominant majority. Right? He says, it perpetuates the position of group inferiority that we feel, even when we're crying out against it. So it actually has a negative cultural effect, right? an actively negative cultural effect. Um, um, he also says that little true, or s little true social or self-understanding has or could come from such a situation, from art that is directly responding to you know, um, the, the white gaze. So, so again, like the strange thing here is that um, many of Locke's criticism of propagandism, uh, propagandist views of art also don't apply to Du Bois, right? So Du Bois actually, um, uh, you know, he, he, I mean, it is the case that Du Bois called for art to be used as a method of gaining sympathy and drawing white people, you know, co-opting them into the movement, but... Um, he actually argued... Am I here? Sorry. Right. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. So, but he actually he actually argued that um, the artistic approach should be one of truthful expression of elements of lived reality by Black Americans. So he stated years in advance of Locke's critiques that he didn't desire these kinds of restrictive representations of Black people. Um, in in 1921, he um, he published the following statement. He said, um, oh, "Hold on a second. 
He said, we have criminals and prostitutes, ignorant and debased elements, just as all folk have. When the artist paints us, he has a right to paint us whole and not ignore everything which is not as perfect as we wish it would be, right? To insist on these motives is wrong and in the end harmful. So Du Bois actually argued that black art should communicate truth. Now one form of this truth should be the objective representation of black characters. Um, so he says, suppose that you were to write a story and put in it the kind of people you know and like and imagine, right? The idea isn't to falsely represent black people as possessing you know, faultless characters, but just to simply communicate uh, you know, the reality of black people as complex human beings. As secondly, Du Bois agreed with Locke that African Americans needed to be the judges of their own aesthetics. So in his 1928 address to the NAACP, he says the ultimate judge has got to be you, um, oops, got to be you. Um, as it is now, we're handing everything over to a white jury. So in fact, the, the, the truth that Du Bois insisted on being communicated was actually a particular kind of black standpoint theory, right? A set of generally shared experiences in the world that permits black people to understand American society in a way that white people don't, right? So far from being a manipulative or propagandist representation of African Americans stiffly posed before the sociologist camera, Du Bois's vision of black art was one in which artistic expression sprang from genuine African-American experiences of the world, right? Um, and he actually, he does this in his own work. So in, um, in his essay from 1904, years and years before, he, in The Souls of Black Folk, he says, through all the book runs a personal and intimate tone of self-revelation. In each essay, I sought to speak from within to depict a world as we see it who dwell therein so that some revelation of how the world looks to me cannot easily escape him, right? The, the, the sort of uh, white reader. Well, so Locke didn't argue that art should be pursued irrespective of its tangible and political effects, and Du Bois didn't advocate for selectively positive representations of African Americans, right? Um, so uh, this really wasn't a simple disagreement between a naive propagandist and a naive purist, right? There was a lot of you know, sophisticated and detailed theorizing going on here. So I don't have time to, unfortunately, elaborate like alternative ways in which I want to understand where their differences lay. Um, I'm going to do it super quick and then and then just finish. So sorry for going too long. But um, but so I actually think there really there really were genuine disagreements right between these two individuals. But they weren't because of the words that they throw around right, purism, propagandism, things like that, art for art's sake. Um, we don't really get, we don't really find that to be a helpful framework. I personally think that it's very misleading. So I actually want to suggest that there are three alternative frameworks that we might want to explore. One is the idea of um, broader social change as the direct or immediate or indirect or derivative or secondary goal, right? Um, so that's one possibility. So while Du Bois believed that art should aim directly at the transformation of perspectives and attitudes, Locke believed black artists should have as their proximate goal the development of a, just a sort of intrinsic black aesthetic that would then, as a secondary step, give rise to these like important political effects, right? Um, a second thing is that the difference between um, the kind of change affected through art as a determinate or indeterminate outcome. So Du Bois really focused on you know, the idea that there is a black subject, right? There is a black subjectivity that should be communicated, right? The black experience should be communicated. For, du for, for Locke, he actually thought, well, this is a democratic process, right? We are forming, we are in formation as a community. So it's really up in the air, the kinds of things that are gonna develop, the kind of aesthetic that's gonna develop, right? So this might actually be another way in which we, we, can, we can analyze the difference between them. And then finally, um, this is something I think is really important and interesting. Where are the boundaries of the aesthetic community of people that are judging the art here, right? So um, it certainly wasn't just white people, but the interesting thing is that I think Du Bois was like, you know what, um, we, can, uh, we can definitely engage with white people and we can develop you know, collaboratively new understandings of ourselves as black people and them as white people, et cetera. So, you know, it can be sort of an ongoing cyclical process between us. Locke was very skeptical about this possibility. He said, no, 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 if we, we have to literally pretend they're not there, 
right? We have to turn inwards. We have to turn away from white society, and we have to really, really introspectively focus on developing our own aesthetic, our own sense of community. Um, he actually, you know, he said that, that, he, that historical representations of African Americans had always just dramatized white psychology, right? White understandings of black people. And that no matter how much we try, we're always gonna get trapped in that process if we continue to engage with these people, right? Um, so thank you for listening and I'm so sorry for going on so long, um, thanks. Thank you so much, Paris, for that lovely talk and also another tour de force in PowerPoint uh, usage there. Um, do we, I'm sure, I mean, it's a talk that raises lots of questions and we can already see hands raised. So if we begin with, with uh, Louis and then we'll go to Ambreen and a vid, I think, after that. Uh, well, yeah, we're, we're, we're inundated with questions. So, Louis, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Parissa. Um, really great outline of kind of uh, a way in which a debate is simplified into a kind of like plus and minus uh, into further nuances. Uh, That's really, really beautiful. Just um, have you read the book um, Whose Art Is It by Janet Kramer, I think is her name. She's, she's talking about the debate of a, of a work of public art that was built for a police station in the Bronx by John Ahern and Rigoberto Torres and the debates within the community, in scare quotes, uh, I think it taps very much into the debates that you're talking about. Um, just one thing that I love, your proposals for three other le possible lenses, uh, really, really great. Um, as I was especially intrigued by the one about the boundaries of aesthetic communities. Um, you, you framed it in terms of kind of an engagement with or without a kind of like white gaze. Um, I think your talk also suggested another way to think about the boundaries of aesthetic communities when you think about class, right? That a middle class black value system might not be the same as a working class black value system and that those two things might be at odds, but understanding the boundaries of those aesthetic communities can offer um, nuances in, in these terms. So I just wanted to kind of mention those two things because they're, they're very suggestive from your presentation. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's super helpful actually. Like class, obviously classism is something that um, the NAACP was accused of so much. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, okay. So yeah, classism. The interesting thing is that classism was something that both of them were accused of, right? Mm -hmm. Locke was accused of being an elitist because he was an esthete, right? And then, mm -hmm. and then Du Bois was accused of being classist because he was a middle class, like very, he was kind of born into mm -hmm. affluence. He was highly educated and um, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's interesting, to, but certainly like classism and who's in, involved is also, of course, it's an internal thing to African-Americans as well as, you know, African-Americans and, and whites. And this, um, this Janet Kramer book, thank you so much for telling me about that. I will definitely give that a read. Well, you know, the title for a book, Whose Art Is It? is so much another way to pose the question about the boundaries of aesthetic community. Who mm -hmm. is the community claiming the art as their own uh, or disclaiming certain aspects of its art as its own? You know? And that debate is so interesting and very complicated, but I think class, I think, becomes an in, a very important element as well as considering like how race and of course gender and other uh, dimensions. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for very wonderful, well-organized talk, and I really want to appreciate you. And there are two themes that came across to me, particularly uh, if we are trying to study what art is or what art could be. So art as a propaganda or art as a means to connect or go inward. So there are two themes like external comparing oneself with the other or internal, just looking into ourselves and what it is. And I'm just wondering, it's, uh, it's a way of, again, the colonial way of looking at things that or or versus. I'm just wondering, can't it be both or a paradoxical, uh, a, a sweet point somewhere where, they are, where art is actually 
both or everything or nothing. And the way you describe the three alternative ways, again, direct or indirect, determinant or in, so I'm, I'm, I just have this, uh, this comment on this binary that are we not thinking about in, in categories in so much cubicles that we are losing the complexity that you already emphasize in the works that are there? Thank you. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think that as a philosopher, as a philosopher I have this, this urge to dichotomize and classify, but you're right. I mean, maybe I'm sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, overturning my own, my, my intention is to complexify <laughs> and then I just sort of categorize. Yeah, um, so that's actually, that's really, that's a really good point. I should, I should think through that a little, a little more closely. Um, but, you know, in terms of, this is, I, I think that the final point is a very, is the most interesting one is, um, engaging with the the white other um, versus engaging just only with oneself or as at least you know qua black person qua black subject um, because I think the strange thing is that um, I think that Locke and Du Bois were both expressivists they were both philosophical expressivists so they both believed that the subject is constantly in formation right um, they both they both believe that there's a sort of there's an inner working out of oneself that takes place, and this is something that Paul Taylor writes on beautifully. And um, there's an inner working out of oneself that is also partially dependent on contingent external factors in the world that are just beyond your control, right? So it's not that there's some like self-realization that is like predestined, but there is maybe a little, right? That there are parameters there that are defined, but there's a whole bunch of external stuff. Now that, that affects it, right, that is contingent. Um, but, you know, the, the interesting thing there is that I think, you know, maybe it's a practical question about the possibility, actually. Like, it's a practical thing. Is it possible to put arbitrary parameters around which external effects are going to affect the person that you're becoming, right? Do we want to try, right, can we? And also then, do we want to try to put external effects on that, uh, external, you know, arbitrary boundaries on that? Um, and I think Locke would say, hopefully we can, and yes, we do want to, um, because, you know, whites are super racist, right? Um, and then, uh, and then uh, Du Bois is like, I think maybe more like, you know, some whites are actually okay, and maybe I don't think it's possible Right, like you were saying, you can't just block out the white other. That's maybe, it's unrealistic. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's a lot to think about there. It's, um, but thanks for your comment, a question. And over to Vid, who spoke on this subject a few years ago. Right. So a similar subject a few well, years ago. Well, well I, I I try to I think connect some something in Du Bois with some of Jeffrey's writings, which I don't know. I was trying to square a circle. I think a bit too much. But um, yeah, thanks so much for this talk. I, it, was, it certainly illuminated for me that debate in a way more nuanced way than certainly I thought about it. Uh, I was wondering whether you thought um, Du Bois and Locke had sort of similar or different ideas about, um, for want of a better word, about beauty or kind of aesthetic standards, if you like. Because I think Paul Taylor has a really interesting take on what Du Bois meant by beauty and this idea that um, whatever Du Bois was in favor of, he certainly wasn't in favor of kind of heavy-handed propagandist art, right? He rather thought that there was something about aesthetic experience that had some kind of social relevance. Um, and so I was wondering whether, you know, that's somewhere where they come together or do they split in some way? Yeah, that's a super good question. Um, so um, beauty, this is, this is something that's really interestingly dealt with also by Leonard Harris and Gooding Williams, Robert Gooding Williams. Um, so, uh, so Gooding Williams specifically, um, if I'm remembering correctly, so he suggests that, no, sorry, this is Harris. <laughs> so Harris suggests that for, for Du Bois, beauty actually depends on, right? It's, it's almost like parasitic on um, a, the revelation of injustice, and um, you know the presentation of a new, more just vision of the world. So there's this there's this really important con conceptual and affective, and this is also where Gooding Williams comes in. There's this really important conceptual and affective transformation that takes place through um, black art, 
I think this is where the propaganda accus accusation comes from, is that what you're trying to do is, of course, you're creating beautiful works, right? Of course, beauty is in there, but that beauty cannot be separated from, like, oh, gosh, imagine if the world were this way, you know? Imagine if the world were, you know, fairer, kinder. Um, uh, whereas, yeah, I think, I think I didn't read in Locke's works, I don't read any kind of indication of that. I don't read any kind of indication that of the you know the Platonic triad being unified. Um, beauty is beauty, and justice is justice. Um, and sure, they can interact and like help each other out, but they're not they're not parasitic on each other. Yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Although that's my opinion, and it's very complicated, and everyone has a different opinion on this. So, but it's it's a, it's a really good question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Did we have a question from you? You, and then we'll go to Anna, and then Adrian. Hi, I'm Megan. Um, so I thank you very much for your talk, by the way. Um, and I hope that my question isn't going to go off on too much of a tangent. But I was actually very curious about those two portraits um, at the beginning and at the end that you showed. And you mentioned briefly that they were um, quite controversial. And I'm not familiar with them or the artist. Um, who created them, and I was just wondering if you could perhaps speak a little bit to that. Yeah, 100%. Um, uh, not a tangent at all, and so glad I have the opportunity to talk about this. So, um, Winold Rice was a German, a white German illustrator. So these two pictures um, appear in The New Negro. Um, so it was illustrations, um, as well as um, uh, essays of various kinds, stories, poems. Um, and so, um, something that some this this contingent of you know let's be let's be respectful, and um, that contingent of African American um, cultural the cultural sort of class, one element that they objected to was how he really emphasized their blackness, right? I mean, there's like um, there are some these are not the most clear uh, indications of this, but you can still see it that you know, the, the really detailed parts are the black skin, right? And there's actually a real simplicity to everything else, which is also, of course, almost completely white or pale. Um, and you see even there are some pictures of certain individuals um, from the Harlem Renaissance that he, where you actually are just like, their, their faces are so dark you can't make out their features. Um, and um, and so, you know, he was he was really thoroughly emphasizing that these people are, you know, black, you know, qua black, right? And and um, there there are also some uh, some very controversial representations of African Americans with um, natural hair, right? Um, like quite frizzy natural hair, um, and. And so there was, yeah, a contingent of African Americans that really objected to this. They were like, this is objectifying, I don't like it, I don't want this kind of representation um, of African Americans, we need to look, I, I don't know, they, they've, it's strange, it's difficult with a modern eye to look at it and say, well, what exactly is the problem here? But there was a problem, and Locke actually wrote a response, <laughs> an essay called, To Certain of Our Philistines, um, <laughs> like critiquing this, this, uh, this problem. Um, so there were lots of things going on there, and these are super interesting portraits um, because, you know, there's the problem that this guy's white, and he's, you know, what's he doing in this anthology? And, and also, what, what is he doing doing portraits of black people? Um, then there's also, you know, um, the super emphasis of, of blackness versus, you know, maybe respectable presentations or something, you know, where respectable means white. Um, there's just, like, a lot. There's, there's a lot going on there, yeah. But I, um, I don't have anything particularly, you know, insightful to say, just that, yeah, that's sort of what, what that's about. Anna O'Meara. Um, when you were speaking about Locke, <clears throat> one of the things that I kept thinking when you talked about self-identification was, you know, the debate around sovereignty and Marcus Garvey. Um, but for Garvey, um, this idea of the African diaspora has to do, in some ways, you know, diaspora refers to the past, whereas the new Negro has this idea of novelty, and it seems like this aesthetic of, you know, um, yeah. It's all up in the air. We don't. We, we need to find a new way to, to define ourselves. Um, could be also 
in debate with that, um, but I'm wondering if he talks about, you know, what defines the potentially, you know, old or, or former. Uh, is your question about Locke or Du Bois or both or Garvey? Or Mostly about, you know, um, Locke and in relation to that debate. To with that Garvey. debate. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is another, this is like such a rich area of scholarship and it was, um, because it's very new to me and I was like, you know, I have a, an ethical and political duty to like fill this gap in my knowledge. And then I was like, whoa, this is so interesting. Like, why, do, why didn't I know about this before? So yeah, this is like another thing that's, that's, really, um, that's really fascinating about this, uh, this moment in time. And this is also something Paul, T Paul Taylor has written about, is that there are these different kinds of, um, uh, wait, Whose book is that? No, that's not Paul Taylor's book. Um, anyway, so there are the, these. There's sort of Afro classicism, classicism, which is the Garvey style of like looking to the past and trying to reclaim this sort of um, uh, maybe almost like regal Africanism, right? Um, that is sort of pushing away all that is American about African Americans, right? Um, and then for Locke, though. There's Afro-modernism, I think, which, which is what it would be called, um, which, is, um, which is the idea that um, actually we are both American and African, and uh, we can unite those in a very innovative way that gives rise to something um, yeah, genuinely new on the world stage. Um, so it was, uh, yeah, that, that was actually, I was actually talking about this to, um, Alan, right, yesterday, um, because it, there's something s s sort of a little strange about it that a lot of people were saying, well, we're reifying racist ideas if we believe ourselves to be in any way closer to Africa, um, you know, and then the other people were like, well, no, we're just like assimilating or sort of like um, self-abnegating if we don't acknowledge our African heritage, and then there are, you know, there's like a whole bunch of different um, ways to, to sort of tread that line. But for Locke, it was in the unification of the two, um, being both African and American, being racial and American, um, that, that, that that's how he wanted to construct it. Yeah. Uh, Alan, would you like to respond to that before Adrian's question, or is your, uh, yours a separate question? Uh, I was thinking of building on the, the question. OK. And then um, Adrian can have a final yeah. question of the session. Yeah, I was just curious about how deeply you've looked into the, the discussions of modernism, um, because this uh, the way you frame Alan Locke's conception of uh, self-racialization through an, a, a deep inquiry um, that's unbounded, you know, uh, a new sense of self, uh, as I wrote, autonomous from from the constructed you know, narratives about what it means to be black, uh, that's so modernist avant-garde. And uh, building on what you're just uh, relating, um, there's really interesting reception of European modernism, particularly looking at um, its foundations in the appropriation from African statuary and so forth on the part of Picasso and others, among, involving Alan Locke and others in the Harlem Renaissance where they're talking about their relation to modernism as it's evolved out of Europe as being a positive thing. Um, and yet at the same time, of course, we know that modernist reception is fraught through with you know, fraught with primitivist notions and things like this. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and then there's the way in which modernism as a movement was also a crisis-evoking phenomena in, in the culture in Europe and North America as well. And so, apologies for stitching all those things together, but I think that might be an, avenue, an interesting avenue for you to explore further. Yeah, I completely agree, and I would like to, I mean, as I was saying to you yesterday, I would like to read your book on modernism and anarchism. Yeah. Um, uh, so the only thing that I really have come across so far is in the development of uh, modernist poetry, so modernist poems. And I think Locke, being a literary critic and a very, like, 
very clear and talented and, and profound one at that, um, has really made me sort of see the transformation in literary styles. He actually compares, I think, an earlier and a later poem of Langston Hughes. And he says, look, Langston Hughes here is um, talking about being black, right? About what it is to be black, using the sort of, you know, quite, quite traditional sort of 19th century sort of, I guess, uh, romantic style of poetry. And, and then he says, and look at this later one, right? Where he actually, there's no, he's not talking about being black anymore. It's weird because the content is actually about being black, but he's saying, he is, it is kind of strange, but he says he's not talking about being black anymore. He is expressing blackness in his style, right? Like this poem could be about anything, but there's a confident self-assuredness um, that there's no more, and there, there is a, yeah, there's no more sort of, it's that, I think it's that disappearance of aboutness. It's become black, right? The poem is a black poem. Um, it's not a, you know, another kind of poem about black people or what it is to be black. And another thing is like, that, that, has tran that transforms in the poems that uh, I found in Locke's literary criticism um, is um, the kind of like movement away from, you know, almost like a kind of very emotional kind of pleading style of like, oh, Amer you know, woe is me, America is unjust, into just like, confidence and self-assuredness and like there is injustice and this is how I how I will deal with it how we will deal with it and this is um I don't know there's there's a transformation of, of, from supplication into a kind of self-assuredness as well so um there are certainly differences but this is again this is in poetry so maybe I should I would like to look into the visual stuff um so that learning curve for me a little um Adrian Blackwell it's Adrian. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, it made me think about um, Cydia Hartman's uh, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. I don't know if you've read it, but um, in one chapter, she she uses like critical fabulation to um, to portray Du Bois in Philadelphia on one of his um, residencies, kind of exploring um, the ghetto, and. Um, She's very critical of Du Bois, I think, in the book. That's part of the idea. The book looks at um, the agency of women to construct new forms of subjectivity um, in urban spaces as they migrate to urban spaces and, and create kind of anarchic lives for themselves. So she thinks of the whole book as a kind of anarchism otherwise. Um, but in a way, I mean, it, it made me think that the, the debate you're describing is being played out in that book in an interesting way. But the critical fabulation is a different method of getting at the debate. Um, I mean, one of the things that struck me is that you, because you're analyzing texts, you're analyzing the two authors' own words and putting them against one another. Um, the question I'm always wondering is, Du Bois is saying one thing, but is he doing that? And, and I think it's interesting to kind of, it, it, I don't know where that opens up in your, in your work, but is there a way to test the statements against the actions in a way? I think, and I think in a, that's what her critical fabulation is kind of doing in a way. It's sort of trying to portray the actions rather than the words in a way of someone like Du Bois. Um, what do you mean by by actions? Because for some reason, up until like literally that sentence that you said, I thought you meant in their own literature, like in their own. So in the like the stories, for example, that Du Bois is writing. Right. Oh right, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I think there are many ways. <laughs> like you know, I mean, you can look at what someone does. I mean, she's looking at how he's acting in space in a way, how he moves through the city. Uh, but I think it just as much in their own writing or whatever they oh, right. do. In right, a way. Right. Oh, I see. So, so the one thing um, that, I mean, there's, of course, there's, you could analyze, for example, um, Souls of Black Folk, right? Or you could, um, you could analyze uh, a variety of things that, that Du Bois has written, I guess, and sort of try and see whether he actually is committing the things he's being accused of by Locke, right? But I think, you know, if you, you know, kind of, if you look at, so, so um, Gooding Williams has analyzed, um, 
story called Jesus Christ in Texas, um, which is about a um, either black or mixed heritage um, Jesus Christ um, who shows up in Texas, very racist uh, situation. And there's a, um, there's a, a white uh, woman, a farmer's wife, um, who has this very deeply incult inculcated racism that we're now very familiar with through sort of, you know, later 20th century theory, that this like affective and motivational and cognitive sort of complex of, of whiteness and, and white supremacy. Um, so sh she possesses that um, and, and there's something that goes on in this sort of, um, she has this kind of vision that is supposed to be a very sort of transformative vision in aesthetic form of, um, of you know, this, this individual, this, uh, this non-white individual that she's met, and she suddenly realizes that he's, you know, he's Jesus, and it, and it's 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 presented in an aesthetic form, supposedly, um, and that transforms her view. So I think there's like there's something like a little on the nose about the story, you know, that maybe could actually be, you could say, okay, you know, actually like luck is kind of right here, um, that this story is very. I guess literal. It's very literal, a, a little bit. Gooding Williams doesn't say that. Um, he 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 likes it, and he he sort of positively analyzes it. But I do think that he's making he's making some kind of um, he's allowing didactic emphasis to quote Locke. He's allowing didactic emphasis to you know choke his sense of artistry, maybe in some of his stories. I don't know, maybe. But yeah, it's a really good suggestion, and I should include that in any work that I write on this, actually. Um, is, is an example, right? Is this actually happening? Karun Koenig. Marissa, I'm wondering if you thought about the argument as a model in general, because of course it's you know, one of those things that um, is an age-old uh, argument, uh, especially in the, theme of, in the context of the theme of the conference um, and whether certain kinds of crises, I mean, your position within them dictates or perhaps gives you, gives you permission to do one or the other, you know, focus purely on kind of more indirect routes uh, or perhaps take, you know, gives you the permission to indulge yourself in in more direct communication, and because I, I see that there's a lot of art when I, I work a lot in Africa, and when I look at some of the works, they're very, <clears throat> they're very specific, a lot of them, and they'll do the mural works and a lot of the um, the hip hop work, and you know they're quite specific. And then other works, uh, there's one artist that they they just were aesthetizing, um, like uh, they call it mabati, which is like kind of corrugated iron, and a lot of the buildings are made out of corrugated iron sheets. Not, it's not iron, it's corrugated something, metal. Um, and so the, it was black and white photographs of buildings made with this material, which is kind of a mark of poverty, but because it was aestheticized, it was, you know, the, the patterns and the order was shown, and, and so in a sense it was a statement, like, you know, this is actually a kind of beauty if you can see it in a certain way. Um, and so that's another kind of project of like re you know, connecting with some sort of elevation, even though you're not really, you don't directly depict that. So, and, and so I'm wondering like, within the, with, if, you're, if you're in a period of crisis, does your position within that as a social group that perhaps is subaltern or oppressed, does that change in, in terms of what phase of the crisis you're in early or late, or if you're at a certain place within it. And if you're an artist that's outside of that community, like this person who, the German artist, do they have a different kind of responsibility? Do they have a different thing to look at? And what can that actually teach us, both as people who are critiquing the art and as well as potentially artists? Yeah, that's a, that's a really wonderful um, thought and wonderful question. I think, um, uh, what, so another way I was thinking of, and I wonder if this is, is relevant to, to your point here, um, another way I was thinking of having this framing, because this is huge, I just, this kind of has exploded in my face and I don't know, there's so much going on here and it's so rich, but another way I was thinking of categorizing the difference was saying there's actually no 
deep metaphysical kind of difference in the theories that these two individuals have about art and its role in human life, right? They're both expressivists. They both believe that art and politics are connected. They both believe lots and lots of stuff. Maybe the difference really is in terms of which capacity and power of art do we focus on and cultivate right now at this moment to most effectively um, arrive wherever it is we want to go. Um, so it's much more practical, you know, um, uh, um, practical uh, requirement, right, dictated by a particular context and moment in time, right? Uh, um, that's, that's one thing I was, I was thinking. So, you know, you know Locke, Locke actually thinks that it'll be more likely to succeed if we focus on the community building elements of, you know, aesthetic, um, cultivation of an aesthetic, a group aesthetic. Whereas Locke is like, no, 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 actually, it's, it'll be more likely to succeed if we focus on those elements. Because they actually, they agree on so much. So I think maybe it just is, like, practically speaking, that's gonna work. No, that my bets are on on this. My bets are on that. Right? Um, I'm not sure if that if that um, at least maybe indicates. You've entered well, thank this, you. Uh, generational experience as well. So maybe there's a practical thing at this moment of time, but there might also be priorities yeah. that their generational experience provides. Yeah, that's also that's a, that is a good point. Lot talks a lot about the younger generation of emerging, you know, um, African-American um, artists and poets. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, well, these are things I should write down <laughs> before I... <laughs> we're, we're, we're just a few minutes away from lunch. I just wanted to ask, to, to wrap up, a question to all three of the speakers this morning. And that question is whether you feel that with regard to your own uh, research, whether for all of its obvious problems, whether crises have been, in your experience, catalysts for cultural or artistic innovation. So for you, Rosalia, whether, for instance, the Mexican muralist movement would have happened without the revolution, uh, and, and to both to the other two of you as well. So I wonder if we can try and link everything up in that way. Um, yeah, I'll be, yeah, I'll be brief. I mean, I think that, um, well, maybe I'll talk about kind of just like two points, right? So one was the, the like the crisis of the Mexican Revolution, right, um, really made way for a total reorganization of society at an institutional level. Um, and muralism as a public art form, right, um, really required the, I mean, first of all, the construction of a public, right, um, which, you know, went from three different, um, you know, supporters of three very different uh, political parties that were in opposition to one another during the revolution um, that needed, you know, kind of a visual form to unite Right, um, but also to transform them from just like a like a public to a, a, a collective of citizens, and so you know part of one of the things that I think um, I'm kind of thinking about um, with Parisa's talk um, is the kind of definition of, of propaganda um, as public art as pop as propaganda, um, and if the murals are kind of just inherently uh, propaganda because they were meant to activate, you know, this new public into into a citizenry, and they were doing it right in this monumental wall painting form that you know was literally kind of attached to government buildings, um, and I think that uh, at least you know kind of in in, in my work. Uh, one of the things that I really want to do is kind of is, is, is question the relationship uh, between the public and uh, muralism as as propaganda, because I think that in Mexican art historiography, there's this claim that uh, the like the muralism from the very beginning, from the 1920s, was uh, propaganda for the state, uh, but. You know, if we look at the, yeah, like the history of the construction of the state during the Reconstruction period and the Mexican Revolution, 
there, there really was no cohesive state and there was no cohesive national identity, right? There were three, um, you know, uh, kind of political kind of like parties, one of them had to claim victory and they used the, like the, you know, kind of muralisms in order to create a very kind of cohesive visual narrative um, of the events of the revolution. And so I think that Salazar um, and, you know, one of my major claims is that he reveals, right, the complexity, um, not just of, uh, you know, kind of how radical actors were reading and making meaning of the murals, um, but also that there was no cohesive narrative for the murals uh, in, in the 1920s. And therefore, um, you know, the, this kind of concept of the state can begin to be, uh, you know, kind of dislodged a little bit from, you know, I'll just take it all the way. We can dislodge it, right, from the, the murals that are on the walls of, of the state building. But I think that, um, you know, just to answer your question, um, there, yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of this relationship to crisis, um, you know, the murals and Salazar's painting are narrativizing, right, um, the, the, the crisis moment and all of the different, you know, events and the leaders and the different oppositional parties. Um, and, and this, yeah, that we can't really see Mexican muralism and, and we probably wouldn't have Mexican muralism without the revolution. Um, yeah, Josh so, Fitzgerald. Yeah, thanks, Josh Fitzgerald. <laughs> um, uh, and I would just second that uh, concept that um, there were crises before uh, the Spanish uh, invasion of Mesoamerica, um, and there were acts uh, to sort of rekindle or form a community around works of art and public works of art. What's fascinating, and this sort of goes along with uh, Parissa's talk, is um, uh, the, the debates that educationists were having, um, uh, European educationists were having about indigenous communities, whether or not they could be um, take the priesthood and become part of the church. So you had regular order clergy having these back and forths that m really echo um, a lot of what uh, W.D. Du Bois and um, Locker sort of arguing is whether we ought to have public works of art that are um, have the potential of being, you know, um, idol, uh, idols behind crosses, sort of this sort of conversation. But the fact that, it, the, the, it, for me, it's a, it's a question about scale, and in this sort of multi-scalar sort of look at space, uh, in that local stories can still exist under this sort of larger um, narrative that's being told. And so to have the crisis, or these Christ, constant crises reoccurring, um, the chance to reflect at that moment on what matters to a local, in a local setting, what matters in the sort of stories you can see in the landscape around you, um, and how you would want to rebuild a church to see all these uh, new churches dot the, the countryside, and each one its own re reflection of a, an indigenous community, a pueblo, being able to say, stake a claim in this new religious and artistic ex form of expression, but also hold on to that traditional sort of knowledge, whether it has a sort of a place as foregrounded as sort of propaganda for the church, or if it's uh, something that is uh, art for community's sake, for a way to kind of hold on to, to memorialize. So yeah, I think it, it's a, this complex sort of exchange, this dialectic that's taking place between the past and the present to talk about uh, the future for a community. Thank you. Oh, there's one here. Um, I've forgotten the question. It's the question <laughs> was whether whether um, you felt that crisis was a catalyst for mm. artistic or cultural, I suppose, or even intellectual mm. uh, innovation. Well, I don't know about intellectual. I think that academics are actually pretty slow. <laughs> um, but uh, I think, um, in some sense, I think, like, when it comes to... African American art, I think crisis is, this is something I really should have thought of before, but I'm not sure it's a very helpful term. I mean, unless crisis is understood as this is like constant low level, you know, I mean, actually quite high level anxiety about, you know, what the future holds or like daily life, daily, you know, interactions in the world. Um, so yeah, um, but certainly, I mean, I don't want to fall into the trap of thinking that, you know, 
mm, black suffering is like so generative. I think that's you know so generative of like beautiful art and things like that. I think that can be very um, white gazy, right? Uh, but um, but definitely, I think that certain kinds of very beautiful forms of art couldn't have come into existence without um, certain kinds of um, 